uh, thank you all for uh, staying with us. This is the final panel, uh, and we thought it would be uh, useful uh, also to have one panel where we can get maybe the perspective of the fabricators. Um, and there has been many uh, questions about how design assist works in, in the design process uh, or how collaborative uh, uh, structures could be set up uh, in order to do advanced R&D. Uh, and I think this uh, example of the uh, uh, ACAL project uh, that HOK put forward working directly with uh, uh, Boston Valley Terracotta, um, uh, Tri-Pyramid, as well as Gartner Permafilisa. So I have with me uh, uh, around the screen here, we have John Neary, who, who is the Senior Facade Specialist at HOK. John has already presented the project, and so we'll proceed with that. Andrew Priest. Andrew is, uh, is here as a, a pre-construction manager and was, uh, I guess, intimately involved with this from Boston Valley Terracotta. Uh, we're also joined by uh, Michael Melhern, is the president of Tri-Pyramid Structures, a, a world-renowned fabricator of structural hardware. We've seen his uh, firm's work on two projects today, uh, the ARRO project as well. And also uh, Roberto uh, Bicchirelli, He's the business development manager and lead concept designer for Gartner Permis de Lisa North America. So what I'm going to start with is share a video of the, uh, uh, the completed prototype. And then thereafter, we'll have a conversation. Terracotta needed to be shaped and molded to accommodate everything. And I think that's the beauty of the material. You can really manipulate it to um, accommodate um, various situations because it is soft and plastic and uh, it's easily moldable explore this uh, interesting concept of going back to an ancient Mayan design in a cathedral and kind of modernize it in a lightweight application and, uh, and marry it up with some you know, gigantic pieces of glass. I think that mock-up is absolutely fabulous and it's um, really the culmination of a great collaboration of materials. None of the materials work alone, you know, the ceramic just doesn't work in, as a tension member and the stainless steel rods that we have in it don't work as a compression member. So that combination uh, really does work very well and the mock-up shows the proof of concept and I think that the uh, collaboration between the designers uh, worked extremely well. that we came up with with the cruciform shape and which is basically split down the middle normal to the building and split parallel to the glass was the result of first of all the desire to have the million span the inside and the outside of, of the glass so you see it sculpturally 
on the outside and it physically connects with the inside. The reinforcement of terracotta when it's used as baguette elements or sunscreen typically involves steel rods inside the terracotta section so that if there's a crack it doesn't fall off. The focus was to bring together all the components of the facade and uh, come out with also a means and method for uh, installing this full-size mock-up, looking eventually for a future uh, application of, uh, of this facade. Wonderful. Um, I think that's a great video to tell the whole story. Uh, let me just start by sort of just uh, because we haven't heard from all of you. I haven't heard from Michael or Roberto and Andrew. So uh, if you guys can um, give me some of your impressions of just the, um, uh, uh, the prototype or just the whole process, uh, maybe from the point of view of um, how was this different? What was specifically different for you in terms of just uh, engaging in this particular process? Um, uh, I'm sure it's not specific to your, your uh, and, and I'm more interested in the, just the process of design and, and how uh, the innovation came about. I don't know who we want to start. Roberto, what you start? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'll, yeah. yeah. Yeah, for us, the, 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 we are always pleased to participate to initiatives that see the use of uh, material in different ways. Um, as been said uh, in all the presentation that uh, before us, particularly the one on Mika that is very inspiring every time he presents things uh, to say, um, that uh, uh, there will be more opaque areas than glaze, but nevertheless, uh, there will be the need of uh, area of the building with uh, high transparency. The usage of the terracotta as a structural component of a facade system is intriguing in its uh, concept. And as been said before, we can play with the dimension of it. That was very intriguing to us. And bringing all together, understanding all the, the modeling, the structural properties of the material and uh, try to define the facade system that can potentially be also used in the future easy to be installed, uh, looking at uh, also further development. We have found this is R&D that has been done in a few weeks. Uh, so it would be nice, uh, like was said before by Mick as well, testing and testing and mock-up and testing and mock-up and testing. It would be nice to bring this to the next level and eventually do a, a full site test mock-up of the, of the system and see what it's gonna bring us and, um, and further develop uh, the system. That was uh, for us, uh, challenging at the same time and intriguing considering the time constraint but also all the components that were in play and uh, the idea of which okay coming out with these uh, you know uh, uh, you know <clears throat> terracotta is again a structural element which was really intriguing per se so that's uh, for us was um, uh, you know the main reason we have accepted to participate there was a, a great uh, opportunity to to understand new material, new way to apply applic uh, apply those materials within a cotton wool system and looking for future application 
and um, has been said between of uh, all the panelists about the resiliency and uh, carbon emission and all that. So we need to look into that direction. And obviously terracotta is a material that helps a lot in this regard, right? It's very uh, friendly and uh, with the low carbon uh, uh, footprints. So <clears throat> that's for us was the main, uh, the main reason and, and challenges at the same time. <clears throat> Uh, I, I think for us, one of the um, big differences here, to, we work in these types of collaborations all the time. We're actually incredibly fortunate in order to be able to work with a number of people who are incredibly clever a lot. Um, and, but one of the things that was real different about this is actually mechanical for us. Um, so, you know, we were presented with a challenge, which is, all right, we need to um, help support this and provide some tension elements and provide the overall um, packaging for those mullions. But the testing that, that John showed in his presentation earlier today, and for those of you who didn't see it, uh, we took a baguette that was similar in type, it wasn't this exact shape, but similar in type, and uh, brought it here to our facility. And on one cold winter day, uh, compressed it in the same way we are in this job. And then we beat the crap out of it. Um, and Doing that gave me an entirely new view of, of the material, and I think gave everybody here a different view of the material. Um, and it's around a different type of resiliency. Uh, it's around the resiliency of just the material. It, it spalled, um, but it, it, it didn't fracture in the way we, we work with a lot of glass in the way we're used to glass fracturing where once it goes, you know, it's done. Um, you know, and, and I, could, I could now say with great faith that, you know, if you use this type of material in this composite like this, um, yeah, if somebody walks past it with their luggage and, and, and bangs into it, which has happened to me in, in a job, the glass job I was on, it's not going to break and fail. It may chip, it may spoil the glazing a little bit, um, but we won't be putting in a new $20,000 piece of glass. Um, and, and, and that speaks a little bit to what Mick was getting at about, you know, this stuff needs to last, you know, if we're replacing it all the time, you know, I, you know, we built a cube that we replaced seven years later. Um, mm -hmm. that's not good for, for the whole, the whole earth picture. Um, and so that for us was a revelation and, and, and worth doing. Uh, Andrew, maybe just picking up a little bit on that, just on, yeah, for Boston Valley, how that was uh, a difference. Yeah, uh, it, so it was great. To, so when we do restoration projects, those are typically somewhat self-loading, but mo for the most part, ter architectural terracotta is just a uh, fancy skin. It's beautiful. It's it, it does have structural properties, but it's generally not exploited that way. So it's great to, to be able to see that be put to use, especially on a curtain wall system. And then working together with the team to develop this, because as I was mentioned, we didn't have a lot of time to um, to really end up where we are. But I think the team just really worked well to iterate together and asked each other the right questions at the right time so we could make refinements to the design and keep pushing forward, which is something that I think is a, a little bit unique to some projects. Some projects are very much, uh, this is the way it needs to be done. And this was very collaborative. It's okay, I, I can't do this, but I can do this. Can you work with this? And it was great to really get everyone together and really just help push the project forward at a very quick pace. And it's really impressive to see how quickly we were able to arrive at a solution that is now a full scale built mock-up. So guys, there's an interesting question here and just in terms of how uh, the design uh, moves forward, it is a question about the orthogonal orientation of the mullions integral to the structural performance uh, like aluminum mullions are, or should the mullion be further warped? I'm thinking, John, uh, here a little bit back to your interest in the Gothic uh, um, mullion uh, and, and how you were maybe imagining it. I know that uh, it, was, it was simplified in this case, but I think you had a uh, a notion that the, the, the whole idea of the mullion uh, not simply just being a, uh, a grid uh, and, and other opportunities are, are really possible. And maybe at the end of your presentation, you also demonstrated or showed some studies you guys are doing now in the kind of almost diagonal mullion systems. Well, that diagonal system sketch is, it's an idea, but it's really just an image right now. I mean, to answer the question that was asked, Yes, the orientation of the mullion is significant. The, the major forces on the facade 
are normal to the, to the surface in terms of negative and positive wind pressure. And this thing has a strong axis, which is aligned with those forces. It has a weak axis, which is not insignificant. I mean, at the length that we were talking about with Nate White from, from um, Tri-Pyramid, the st stability of the mullion is a considerable issue. So the pre-stressing that we did was enough, as I mentioned, he had deflection of L over 5,000 compared to L over 175 for a normal mullion. So I'm sure you could turn this mullion sideways and it could take the wind that we were talking about, but to make it most efficient, that, that direction is, is important, significant. But I do think speaking to the material though, um, and Andrew can speak to this better than me, but um, you know, it's extruded. And it's, you know, and when it's extruded, you have an opportunity to, to change the profile of the mull, um, keeping with what John is saying, you know, you need to get the mechanical properties right, but um, the, the, the opportunity to customize without having it be um, a bank breaker, uh, I, th I think is quite real. And so um, you could have potent potentially the look of non-orthogonality uh, oh, yeah, and sure. at the same time, the mechanical properties that you need. I don't know if you noticed that one image I showed of the 23 versions that was <laughs> one, one page of many pages that Victoria created and looking at all kinds of shapes. And so, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's one of this, this plastic quality that John Krauss spoke of is one of the really appealing things about the material. I think that the same concept that can be also expanded to the integration of the other material within the facade. Uh, um, uh, all the detail uh, uh, in conjunction with the glass, for example, right? We started with the idea to have uh, actually a more complicated uh, combination between terracotta, aluminum, extrusion, ternary broken along the perimeter. Then we ended up to to do what Mick um, alluded in, uh, in his presentation, to actually take out components as much as possible to go with a more simple, just piece of glass within the terracotta, let the terracotta be the, 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 the frame to carry in it. So also this connection with the other material, flashing at the bottom, covings at the top, uh, bracket or connecting the column to the seat structure and all that. Uh, the beauty of the idea that we come out with it is, uh, is a custom, it can be customized, it can be adapted with multiple different scenarios, thinking a different material, infill material as well, not only glass for that matter, and um, modifying the shape, uh, allowing an easy replacement of the components uh, in case of breakages. All these are all uh, things that they need to be further developed, but they are possible because of the, like Michael was saying, is an extruded material. So you can extrude really the shape that you want and the combine them also and uh, in creating, facilitating uh, also the installation, the means and method and, uh, and uh, look at the safety, right? Designing also thinking about the safety of the, uh, um, of the workers is important. <clears throat> And that, and that can be absolutely done. So it's a, right. it's a beautiful uh, opportunity. <clears throat> and you can bring aesthetics into the play too, right? Correct. So we were talking yeah. about how does it structurally behave with different extrusions, but the interior and exterior mullions can be totally different looking, but they perform exactly the same way and still are basically that terracotta beam that sure. gives every, uh, the strength. And where this, you know, John in the presentation uh, showed also the possibility to open up and create, check what is the longest piece can be can be produced, and try to reduce the the number of plates involved and lower the uh, carbon footprint automatically and all that. So these are all uh, areas of uh, development right. that are really interesting. There's a comment in here from from Sanjeev Tanka about using the glass to stabilize the mullion, which I've talked to Nate White about. In addition to the spread on the tension cords. To make it more efficient, he's he's thought about using the glass to brace the terracotta in the plane of the wall. And there's a number of interactions like that that suggested themselves that we didn't have time to explore really. It, it seems uh, as as you're talking about, I mean, there's a kind of uh, reduction almost down to first principles. Uh, and and Roberto, even as you're saying it, you you were imagining to even go further. You know, could we reduce it more, more, more until it's just the essential? Then it just becomes a 
truly a prototype that then people can customize in different right. kinds of ways, yeah. right? Um, I, I guess part of it is also the labor of it. Uh, and, and I thought maybe of, of, you know, once you have a system, I know that at points we were talking about unitization or other kinds of ways, just uh, it, putting something like this up or, um, uh, or thinking about it in that way. We're, in your conversations, I know the prototype is, 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 is different. Did this come up? Uh, was there some thinking about it? Uh, like that could be a next step to think about what we would do? Uh, uh, with the prototype? Um, I, I, I believe so, I believe so. I mean, um, you know, putting it together um, uh, once the, the, the column are fully, fully prepared and stuff like that, it was not really a big effort actually. It was uh, hmm. uh, pretty, pretty easy, right? And it doesn't really matter the dimension of the columns. You know? This is, uh, uh, a relatively small uh, mock-up, uh, although is uh, a great mock-up uh, size-wise, uh, considering uh, the, the stage of the study that we are in. But um, uh, I don't see we don't see any uh, really uh, problem uh, related to the physicality of it, the dimension of it, right? And you saw from uh, uh, the tripyramid uh, uh, shop uh, um, that the assembly or the sub-assembly. I think we think that maybe we have. Uh, uh, to look a little bit more um, uh, <clears throat> to the to the area related uh, um, to the inside and outside terracotta element that's spanning horizontal in between the columns, um, you know, to to have a more integration of those uh, some of those integrated within the column itself, for example, rather than everything solid as we ended up to do it in uh, in uh, in this uh, in this mockup. But uh, uh, definitely there are area of improvements, but the starting point is, uh, was, was terrific, I had to say, because we put it together in a, a week, uh, in seven days, considering there were a couple of days of rain as well in between uh, disturbing us. So it, it went quite, quite, quite well. <clears throat> yeah, and I don't I think, would... I think uh, Michael, you, you put the columns together in uh, what, two days? Yeah, day and yeah. a day, really. Day and a half, um, yeah. Three. Yeah, it's, it's like any other job. It takes you a day to learn it, and then you know, and then it was super quick. Yeah. Um, and 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 in terms of modularization, um, you know, this is something we talk about a lot with our clients. This is a this is a process. So, um, you know, it will seem bespoke for a while. You know, there'll be some entryways or some some um, plaza work or something like that. And, and in that. Uh, we will collectively learn more. And, and to the, um, the question that was asked uh, on the chat about the building authorities and, and you know, do they demand special testing? Um, we'll build some small one of these and, and we will learn how to test it and we will convince the local building authorities that yeah, it's fine. And, and in that, we ultimately grow to a place where we can uh, panelize it, where maybe you can make it modular and treat it like a, a, you know, a, a full on skin but uh, it's, a, it's a stepwise process and um, sadly a little bit, but that's, that's the way it'll go. That um, won't keep us from experimenting with that idea, at least on no. the screen, or maybe yeah. some smaller mock-ups, I, I hope, or something like that. Yeah, and I think there's a lot of opportunities. Like Roberto said, it's, it was actually very impressive how quickly this all went together. I think there's just minor changes that I think we all recognize where each one must make a little change here or there, which could help the assembly all go together. But I mean, from uh, inception to now, it's basically been eight months. So for the fact that we arrived here, it's, it's pretty great. And I think Roberto was actually probably even less than a week that it got assembled in. Yeah. The <laughs> Uh, yeah, if you add all the meat and greedy and all the yeah. gingerbread around, yes, there were a lot of stuff that was nothing to do with the facade itself, right? The, the, the roof and everything, yes, yes. Yep. You're right. Um, maybe I can shift the discussion. I know that, uh, you know, the, the, the incredible success of this and we want to build on such a success in ACAO. I mean, ACAO, um, uh, as Eric uh, right before was saying, you know, we had right from the beginning this question of composite uh, structures, uh, composite um, materials was, was very much part of because um, even as people were playing with the ceramics and uh, terracotta, this idea of just a, a surface uh, was never uh, enough. And there were different ways of thinking about that. And I think this particular prototype takes us 
to, to a, you know, not only in, um, a level of resolution, a level of testing that maybe other prototypes have not. Uh, but I guess I'm, I'm trying to think also about um, the workshop allowed for that, but the workshop isn't what the world is. Uh, and uh, clearly it isn't something that, uh, you know, John, you could necessarily tack on to an experiment in, a, um, in an actual project. Maybe you could, I don't know. I know there's some firms that have uh, put some provisions for research into uh, their fee structure, or for that matter, either, you know, Michael, you guys, or, or, or Roberto, in your thinking as you're doing mock-ups and saying, no, we want to do it. I, I'm just trying to think of your business models and, and how you think you may have to change that. I'm, I'm also thinking of mix, uh, you know, um, uh, I guess challenge to us. Uh, ultimately, this is not, you know, unless we do every, everything becomes a cow, uh, this kind of innovation or this kind of space, and, and it's, it's not necessarily sustainable either, right? Well, so my, my, yeah, my question really is just in your practice, how do you do, how would you start to maybe adopt this? Or uh, yeah, adopt this more. Yeah, yeah. I'll have a go. Um, you know, this is a very collaborative industry. Uh, when um, you know there are still people here seven hours later uh, watching, <laughs> watching us talk, and um, you know we share what we've done. Um, look, you know, thirty some odd years ago when we built the pyramid at the Louvre, it looked like uh, you know. The, it was, it was cutting edge. And John was there, I was there, it was totally cutting edge. For those of us in the industry, I look at that today and um, it's heavy, it's dense, and you wouldn't do it that way today for a whole lot of technological reasons. Um, we're no smarter, but we've done more things. And so we will share this as we go about uh, our business and, and John will share it. And so, as I said a minute ago, uh, to answer a slightly different question, the growth will be, I think, stepwise, uh, and it will be, um, it will be owners who have, it's not risk tolerance so much as uh, a little bit of creativity and and being able to imagine something. And it will probably be university work. If I had to guess. The first one of these rebuilt will probably be university work, um, which is fine. Um, but that, it, for me, it's a collaboration thing. And and you're, uh, God bless, you know, uh, Boston Valley Terracotta. I mean, they're spending a lot of time and money starting this collaboration, you know, in ACOG. So yeah, but but uh, Michael um, and I apologize. I I I referring on the meek presentation continuously, but he said it all. Uh, I, to be honest with you, he said it all. That this one, it was a terrific presentation. He, he touched a point at a certain point that he said this. Uh, you know, innovation is a uh, is a. Uh, is not a word that is in the mind of the developer or a client because the first question that they have when you had done it how many times you had done it show me prove me show me tests and all these things and obviously when we are talking about everything that we saw today there is almost nothing that we can we can prove so the, the importance of echo to me is actually this to give the opportunity look at the morphosis job right it was mentioned that uh, they did uh, the year before, because of ACA, they did a, a, a prototype. And then on that concept, they spin it off and they try when they had an opportunity to propose to a client for a, for a museum, right? Successfully. And hopefully, probably the development of that design was not even close to the idea that was developed during the prototype uh, phase. But nevertheless, ACA gave the opportunity for that concept to grow and so who is the, 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 the is a collaborative team. I, and that's, I agree hundred percent with you. And we are behind pushing who, to me, the architects. They are the only, the only one that can make that happen. There is nobody else. We are not Great. so strong with the client to be able to go there, convince them. Yeah, we can tell them, look what we have done with HOK, with Rebirami, with Boston Valley. Yes, we, that will help, but, uh, are the architects that ultimately they need to see the possibility, they know their client, they know the budget that they had to, to work with, and they are the one that had to advocate for this innovation and push it through. And uh, 
20 years from now, probably someone will come and will design a much better system than what we have done today, like happened to the uh, uh, Pyramid of Louvre, but um, you know, that's life, I guess. <clears throat> But that's, I think, uh, the, the way I see it. We will promote it. We did the video that you guys have seen with this idea, right? To As a marketing tool for all of us. Uh, but I had to thank ECA for the opportunity to be able to do that. Because without that, uh, this symposium and this uh, workshop, we were not able to, to do it. So that's, uh, that's exactly the importance of ECA, in my opinion. And then uh, the, the batons now is uh, on, uh, on, uh, on John and, uh, and his community <laughs> in trying to, uh, you know, find the right client and, uh, and then bring, a, bring us in and we will support him as a, as a team. And then- uh, Absolutely. All the way through, that's for sure. Um, but that's, a, that's the way I see it. For us, it will be as a, you know, we are subcontractors. So we are, you know, at the bottom of the- <laughs> <laughs> really, we are not going to be so strong to, to be able to do it. One thing that I said before that maybe help um, for an archive, which if uh, we had the strength and maybe some money and, and, uh, and finance some R&D and bring this uh, visual mock-up to a, a status of a performance mock-up and go to a physical test, and, mm. and that may be will give us uh, some more uh, leverage to all of us, obviously, uh, because now you are, you know, uh, presenting something more mature and, and all that. So, uh, mm -hmm. but that's the only uh, small contribution I can give at this point. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that the comparison to the Louvre is apt in that there were components there that had been used on sailboats and somewhat by Peter Rice at the, Museum of Science and et cetera, that were then elaborated on. And, and here, we weren't really sure if you could use the terracotta as a compression element without it shattering under some kind of impact, as we said. I think that little test in the parking lot, but also the development of this, of this mock-up really does show that there is potential there. And that is not something that we could have done without talking to Michael and Boston Valley about simultaneously and getting that information from John Carty. So, I mean, it's a little bit of both. I think saying that, that if we were to do something like this with a material that's been around for a while and components that we're familiar with in a slightly new combination, it's not entirely unprecedented or, or hard to imagine, but this gave it some impetus by demonstrating that you could do at least you know, this much and then to Robert Roberto's point, if we could do some more in the same spirit or actually test it, that would be yet more convincing perhaps. But I, I don't think it's such an outlandish proposition to say if you had a lobby where you're gonna do a big glass fin or do some other kind of a tensile structure, you could do this instead. Um. I think we're coming close to our, our, the end of our, uh, um, our panel here. Uh, let's see here, there's, there's a question. Uh, how are innovative systems being sold to uh, clients um, from the manufacturing side? Uh, and does it, does it uh, I guess the question is, does it come down to the architects pushing it in the same way? I mean, ultimately, I think it reverts at the same point that you're sourcing. Uh, in some ways, you are saying that there's tremendous agency that architects do have in order to convince uh, towards that. I think historically that has been true. I think architects don't feel that's the case. John, do you feel that that's uh, less of the case? I mean, obviously, the, the Louvre uh, pyramid, I, you know, if it wasn't Diane Pei pushing it, it probably is, is not something to come uh, about. So I'm just wondering no. how you're thinking about well, it. Thing. But but, but IM wasn't just fabricating this concept out of thin air either. He had other projects and things that, including the, the SARES that he was aware of that, that informed this concept. And that's what I'm saying. I think, yes, certainly the architect's the one who conceives the, the building usually, the, the concept for the building. But um, then to propose a, a construct like this, be able to say, we've talked to Permis de Lisa and Tri Pyramid and Boston Valley about it gives it credence that it would certainly lack 
otherwise. And to have done some experimentation is a is another degree of credibility, I think. But yeah, we would initiate it on a project. I don't unless there's a client who would just go to Michael and say, I want whatever you're whatever you're, you know, cooking up. But maybe that happens. I wouldn't be surprised. But and I would say too, from a manufacturer manufacturer's point of view, I don't think to Scott's question, I don't see us ever really bypassing a designer. I think the designer is actually who forces us to be more innovative with our solutions, right? We have basically off the shelf componentry that we can apply to a variety of custom solutions. But uh, there's going to be a point in time where like this project where that just solution will not work. So the designer came to us with a concept and we all work together with the designer hand in hand to figure out how to to deliver that solution. I think that's uh, kind of how it has to go because the manufacturer there, we're trying to, to manufacture. We're not always trying to be on the cutting edge. We try to use a lot of cutting edge technology to help us work faster, be more nimble, respond to design mm -hmm. requests or and that way. But I think a designer is always going to be a part of that innovative portion. I also think that the, the role of designer here as integrator is, is really important. I mean, we're talking about integrated materials, integrated systems. Uh, the designer is the one who's integrating these three systems in some ways. So I think there's tremendous responsibility. I think the question that, you know, uh, Mike, Michael, do you, do you find yourself like a client coming and saying, do something for me? And, and it, that's probably not the, <laughs> the, the general route of your business. No, it's not. And it's actually my worst nightmare. Um, and, and I'm in one of those right now. I'm, uh, I, I'm building a unit right now that has a lot of specialty materials in it. And it doesn't have a strong uh, architect designer uh, input. It has a lot of specialists, all of whom are pretty good at what we do. Um, but there's nobody stirring the pot effectively. And, um, and it's, it is a nightmare. I'm telling you right now. Um, and I, uh, so so no, I don't think we can bypass. At the same time, we each serve a little function. You know, uh, Andrew's got a sample room where he is. I have a sample room where I am. And by God, uh, Roberto's got like my acres and acres of, of mock-ups and things. So you know, when you show it off, you know, it, while it doesn't necessarily sell to the client who's there looking at the mock-up for a project we're building with them, these guys don't forget and particularly the private university kind of people who are going to hold their buildings for 30 to 50 to 100 years. The, 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 there are people in those teams that will actually go to their designer and say, hey, I saw this and it's cool. Um, right. Well, that's what so, I'm talking about. Yeah. So, so, so we each have a role, but to answer the question directly, no, we, we, we don't have the juice to sell it. <laughs> Well, uh, guys, thank you so much. This, I think um, it, the, um, this particular prototype has really set up a whole, I think, uh, other level for us. It really opens a cow up, I think, in, in very interesting way. And, and I'm, uh, I'm just uh, recognizing Mick all, as well, who has uh, uh, a few times sort of said uh, uh, how, how uh, significant he sees that our role is in terms of this innovation. Um, but I do uh, look forward to seeing how, how we can continue to have you be part of ACOW uh, as we move forward. I, uh, Mike, I, Michael, I hope you know, we can really keep you involved in this uh, process. There's a lot of innovation and, and interesting teams coming for next year. Uh, so with that, thank you all, guys. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Omar, thank you. well done today. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Omar. Thank you.